So in this video, I'm going to walk through really the details about the blog post that dives into automating a deployment to Azure Infrastructure as a Service, but injecting into that some custom applications. And I'm doing this through PowerShell. I'm not using JSON templates. There's already a lot of JSON templates out there on GitHub to talk about installing SQL, installing SharePoint. So I wanted to actually do this just with PowerShell, but then using the VM agent custom script extension to actually pass PowerShell in via the agent and inject it into the VM. So I'm not using WinRM, this is actually using the VM agent to actually call PowerShell that's gonna create a domain controller, uh, install SQL, install SharePoint. So my goal was I ran a proof of concept and I needed to have really a single click creation of a single box test dev environment. And this test dev environment was gonna be running in Azure I'm using Azure Resource Manager, and it needed to be a domain controller, a SQL server, and a SharePoint server. So when I think about that, I have to create a new resource group that's gonna contain a new storage account, in this case, a new virtual network, and then into that, I'll add the virtual machines network interface and the VM itself. <laughs> By putting them all together in a resource group, that keeps their life cycle together. I can create them together, and ultimately delete them together. And then once I create that VM and the storage account and the network, there's gonna be two phases of PowerShell. Firstly, I'm gonna to need to initialize and format the data disks I'll attach. I'm gonna to need to add two data disks to it, one for the Active Directory database and one for the SQL and SharePoint database. I don't wanna run those on the OS disk because that has read-write caching, which I want for the operating system whereas my data disk will have no caching. So that first bit of PowerShell is gonna to need to initialize the disks, format them, and then make it a domain controller. So let's actually look at what that PowerShell would be. So this is my first boot. And you can see what I do here is I find any disk that has a partition type of raw, and I initialize it GPT. Now I wanna use drive letters E and F for my two data disks. But by default, there's already a virtual CD drive that's E. So I'm just going to use a little bit of PowerShell here by the WMI object to find the current E letter, change it to L, and then make that change apply. So I'm changing the CD drive to use L. I then get the disk number two, create a partition, give it drive letter E, and format it. Make sure I do a quick format, which is the default. Otherwise, it will allocate all of the space actually on the disk and then I'm gonna pay for that. Azure Storage charges you based on data written, not the size of the disk. And I repeat the same for the second data disk. So this code here is simply bringing the volumes online, changing the drive of the CD, and then initializing my two data disks. So once I've done that, I need to install Active Directory, and that's actually very simple through PowerShell. I import the server manager module, I don't need to, with PowerShell 3 and above, it will auto load the modules, but for completeness, I'm gonna import the module. I'm adding Active Directory and DNS. And then in this case, I'm just calling it POC DOM. That was my POC domain. Make sure that my Active Directory database, the logs and sysvol are all on that first data disk. I don't want them on the C drive. I want that no caching disk. For me, it's a test environment. I do not care. I'm just making the safe mode password, password. Then I store that as a secure string. And I simply use the install ADDS forest command lit with the various variables I've created to create a new Active Directory domain. At this point, the virtual machine would reboot and it'll take about five minutes, so I'll wait for that. Now, once it comes back, I now need to continue with the installation. So here in my second boot code, I actually add an account called administrator and make it a domain admin. By default, Azure doesn't like you using administrator because, hey, it's something that attackers will use. So generally I wouldn't add this, but again, for this POC, it was a requirement to have an administrator account. Generally, I don't advise you actually have this in there. Then I'm gonna open up two firewall ports inside that VM, one for SQL, 1433, and one for SharePoint, 2013. Now at this point, I need to 
get some assets. I need the SQL installation media available and I need the SharePoint installation media available. And I want to do an unattended installation of those. Now for SQL, that's very easy. I can manually run the setup.exe on an on-premises box or in Azure. I go through the entire wizard. On the last page of the wizard, it will actually show me the configuration file it's built based on the answers I gave in the wizard. I'm just going to take that file and save it away somewhere. And then I call the SQL setup with a slash configuration file to do an unattended install. So SQL is actually very easy. For SharePoint, it's a little bit more complex. There is a site called autospinstaller.com and I list this in the blog entry that goes with this video. It's a tool that uses the SharePoint install media and it has a web-based page where I type in all the various values I need for my environment and it creates an XML-based configuration file that lets me unattend install SharePoint. I have to create some accounts. So this is me creating all the accounts it needs for the SharePoint install. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually copy all those installation files and the assets to an Azure Files account. So Azure Files is just one of the storage services available in Azure Storage Accounts. So what I do is I create an Azure Storage Account. So I created a regular storage account. If I go to my files, I created a new share called POC Assets. And then into that, I'm going to copy the various setup media for SharePoint, SQL, and my configuration answer file. The easiest way to actually do that copying is with the free Azure Storage Explorer tool. Here you can see I'm looking at that storage account I created. I'm looking at the share I created. And I simply do upload, and I can upload entire folders. So the Auto SP installer is the SharePoint installation structure. SQL Server 2012 SP3 is just the SQL Server installation media. And then my Azure scripts is actually just my SQL configuration file. It gives me the unattended install. That's it. So there's all the different pieces of media I need to do the install. So what I do in my file is I need the storage key from the account, which I can get if I look at my storage account click access keys it will show me the storage key and the storage account name that I need so I would put those values into my storage key here and then my storage account name here so this is going to go and map to that share I created POC assets with the storage account name here that I would also match to this part and your storage account key which is here so make sure you change this username value to the same as your storage account name as well. So just for completeness as you look at this, this should actually be that. And I then copy the contents of the SharePoint install and also that SQL Server configuration script. And then I run the SQL install directly from the share. I don't copy that over, there's no need. I just run it directly from the share. Once the SQL install is finished, I remove that drive mapping. And then it's just triggering the SharePoint install. I just do a start job to run it as an asynchronous job. And I call from that locally copied folder, the auto SP installer launch. Now I run it as a start job because what I found is, even though it's an unattended installation, there's a few places at the end where it says, okay, we're finished, now press a key. Well, in my script, that would make it hang. So rather than have to go through and take out all the pause commands in their code, I simply run it asynchronously and wait for about 40 minutes. That's how long it takes to complete. And then it's done. So these are the two setup files for the PowerShell. And for these files, I upload those into a blob. So once again, I can use the same storage account I have. So my storage account, I also have blobs. I create a scripts container. Then I can use the Azure Storage Explorer to copy up my two PowerShell files. And again, these are actually listed and linked uh, in the blog article that goes with this video. So now I have my PowerShell files in blobs and all my installation media in a file share. And that's really all of the setup. The next step is literally just to run it. 
So here's the PowerShell to actually create the VM and use those scripts. So I create a filter called timestamp. All it does is it adds the current timestamp to any command that gets sent to it. I use that for logging. So you can see I say write output setting up the VM resources, send that to timestamp. So timestamp will output setting up VM resources and variables and then add the time. Then I create variables, the resource group name, the storage account name, the storage account type. Now I'm using premium just for performance. You don't have to do that. I specify location, a virtual network name, a VM name. Make sure you use something unique because this is actually going to be the same for the DNS name for the public IP I add. So not everyone can use the same name. So you'd have to add some kind of uniqueness into there. Because it's using premium storage, I need a something S series VM, so I'm using a DS2. I grabbed the latest standard 2012 R2 image. So I'm trying to prove here there's nothing going on behind the scenes. I've not got some special image with code baked into it. I'm just using an image directly from the Azure library. So I get the latest version. I create my resource group. I create my storage account. So this is all in that resource group I create. It's going to share a common life cycle. I create the virtual network, a subnet, a virtual machine configuration. I am giving it a public IP in this case because I'm putting on its own distinct virtual network that does not have connectivity to on-premises. So the only way I can get to it is from the internet. If this was part of a more standardized POC lab that was going to go on an existing virtual network, I wouldn't want the public IP unless I needed to actually advertise something out to the internet. But in this case, I'm trying to make it very self-contained and not require other connectivity. So I'm adding a public IP. Now also, you really should use a network security group to lock down the types of traffic you're going to let in from this thing. And again, that goes with the not adding an administrator account with the generic name with a simple password. So consider all those things. I want to minimize services exposed to the internet. And if I do, we'll make those things complex. I create a network interface using the public IP, using the virtual network, and I add it to the VM config. I'm going to create a new OS disk, and I'm going to add two data disks. Remember, my first is my AD, the second is my SQL and SharePoint, and I'm using no caching for both of those. Then I'm going to actually go and create the virtual machine. Once I've created the virtual machine, I need access to the storage account where those two PowerShell scripts are stored. So you would add in here the blob account name and your blob key, that account key. And add that name as well into the blob URL. And then all I'm doing is I'm setting the various attributes for my first boot script. I'm using the custom script extension. I need a unique timestamp, so I'm just doing the ticks for the current date. And then I trigger it via the set Azure RM extension and using all these variables I've configured. I can check the status with this command and I'm going to wait five minutes. So it's going to run the VM extension. Once it completes, it should carry on. I can look at the status of it. I'm going to wait five minutes for that reboot. So I'm going to sleep 300 seconds. I have to remove the existing custom script extension because you can only have one per VM. And then I'm going to just call the second boot PowerShell script because it's now rebooted, which will add the accounts, open the firewall exceptions, install SQL and install SharePoint. And I'm done. So that's just kind of walking through all the various components. Now this is probably easiest to see if I actually just run this. So I'll create my filter. I'll go and define all my various variables. I'll create my resource group. I'll go and create a new storage account. I'll go and create the virtual network and create the network interface, adding it to the VM object. Once that's done, I'll just set up the disk and add in those data disks for it.
So I'll trigger that. And then I'm just going to go and create the virtual machine using all those various objects I've created. The resource group, the storage account, the virtual network, the network interface, which is using the virtual network and the public IP I created. And then once this completes, I'll have that virtual machine sitting there. So that VM creation has now completed. Now just to show I'm not cheating, I'm going to actually connect to that virtual machine quickly. So this is the DNS name I gave the VM in my example. So don't use POC1 VM for you, it won't work. That's obviously a DNS name, so it has to be globally unique. So I'm going to connect into it. And what I want to demonstrate is it's basically just an empty VM. This was taken straight from the 2012 R2. It's the latest version in the Azure library. So here we go. And right now it's not a domain controller. There's no DNS on it. It's the first time it's run. If I look at my admin tools, there's no AD stuff in there. If I look at my local server, it's just gonna be in a work group. There's nothing configured for it. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna inject that second, sorry, the first PowerShell script. Now remember, the first PowerShell script makes it a DC and also will bring the disks online. So if I look right now, it has C, D, and E. There's no disks yet. So that first PowerShell script, now I already run with the valid storage account key. Scroll down, here we go. So obviously this is the correct key you would have for your environment with the correct storage account name and URL. So you would execute that. Now I'm executing this one piece of a time just to show you, show you it building. In reality, you would just have this file and execute and it would create a VM. So I'm gonna set up all these various variables and then just say, inject it, go. So that's now injecting that first boot script, the PowerShell, not through WinRM, this is via the VM agent, creating a custom script extension for it and injecting it into the virtual machine. And I will see stuff happen inside the VM. Yes, I'm gonna see drive letters change. I'm gonna see uh, disks get created. I'll even get errors pop up saying, hey, this disk isn't formatted because all the OS sees is a disk brought online, but nothing's on it yet. So I'm gonna leave that kind of tucked over there. But if I open another window, what I'll see is when that custom script extension is getting installed, I'll see a plugin. So what I'll see is Microsoft uh, custom script extension will get added to this virtual machine. So that's how I know the fabric has actually added that script extension. And it will then copy, there we go. And it will now copy into it my PowerShell script. So this is what it's gonna execute. If I quickly look at that, you can see the CD drive just changed. So it's now running that script that I injected in. It's moaning at me because, hey, this disk isn't formatted, but it's doing it behind the scenes. So my F disk will suddenly appear because it's doing the formatting. There we go, behind the scenes. And now it's gonna go and install Active Directory. It's gonna install DNS and it's gonna promote it to be a domain controller. And like there's various things, there's status files in here. When this is finished, I output the substatuses of the extension name. And what that's really gonna show me is the content of the status file. Like if I was to quickly look at that right now, you can see that formatted message, asynchronously executing commands, it's doing those drive letter changes, it's formatting the disks, it's moaning, so you can see it started to run the Active Directory configuration and the DNS configuration. It's saying, hey, this box doesn't have a static IP. Remember, Azure VMs never have a static IP inside them, but at the Azure Fabric, we did give it a static IP address. So even though it's using DHCP, it would always be given the same IP address by the Azure Fabric because as part of the PowerShell we used, if I scroll back up, its network interface object, I specified the private IP address. 
So that VM will always get 10.10.1.10. So although inside it's using DHCP, the reality is it will always get the same IP address. So we can ignore the warnings where it's saying, hey, you have a dynamically assigned IP address. Yes, it thinks it does, but the reality is the fabric will always give it the same IP. So it's going to go through, and eventually what we should do is get kicked off of this, because as part of the Active Directory, it's going to reboot the box. So there we go, it's just actually flashed up. You're about to be signed out because of ADDS. So I can see there, I've installed Active Directory. So that would reboot. And the next thing my script will now do is it's going to sit and wait five minutes. That's probably a bit on the generous side, but I'm going to give it five minutes to reboot. So ordinarily this code will just sleep for five minutes. I can see that status code came back true. And if I actually look at that status, it shows me all of the output for all the commands that I ran in that PowerShell. Formatting the disks, making it a domain controller, installing DNS, and I can see it succeeded. So now I'll give it that five minutes, and we can connect back into the VM. We should now see it's a domain controller. So the benefit of running it interactively, I've just been checking, and it's actually come back already less than five minutes. So this is its first boot after being made a domain controller. So now what we should see is under the server manager, it should show it's part of a domain. I should have the Active Directory tools. I should have DNS. And as part of that promotion, it would have actually automatically changed its DNS config to point to 127.0.0.1. Now, generally that's a no-no. For this instance, it's actually fine because it's got DNS on it. So it's going to do its own resolution to external names. I could also st stop that happening. I can suppress it. And as part of my NIC configuration, I can give it a per NIC DNS override that would be set via DHCP and make it point to itself. But I didn't do that in this instance. If I look at local server, it's now part of that domain. I have the Active Directory users and computers there. And essentially at this point, I'm, I'm good to carry on with my script. Now, so the first thing it has to do now is remove the old extension. I can only have one instance of a custom script extension. Even if it's a different name, I can only have one instance. So I have to remove the old one first. And then all I will do is once that completes, I'm going to trigger the second boot script. The second boot is one that adds the firewall exceptions. It's the one that adds the extra SharePoint accounts. It's the one that installs SQL and then installs SharePoint. And that's going to take a long time. I mean, I have a 40 minute wait in there. Uh, the SQL install itself takes about 10 minutes. So this is probably going to take about an hour to actually complete. But I mean, that's, that's kind of the overall demo. This is now just a more specific example. I'm just calling another PowerShell script. There's nothing different from the first one other than its content, which is not the point of this video. The point of this video is just, hey, here's how I can really do anything I want. And again, this was just a generic image, nothing special set up. I'm leveraging Azure files, I'm using Azure blobs for my PowerShell scripts, and then really just using those custom script extensions to do the work I want. So I'm going to inject that second one. Once again inside the VM, if I was keeping an eye on the file system, I would see the packages, I will see a new custom script extension get added to it. The file this time will be second boot, and it will go through and do all of that configuration. There we go. And there's my file. So we'll let that bake. It's probably about an hour. And then we'll uh, we'll come back to it. If I was very much spying, I could go and look in Task Manager. And what I should see is a bunch of different things get kicked off. Um, SQL would install all its prereqs uh, as part of the initial installation. I should open up those firewall rules that I specified. So if I looked at my firewall, the first thing I do is I add those two firewall exceptions. So by now, I should see the SQL and the SharePoint have been added. Uh, I would also probably by now, actually no, I think I'll do that later on, but I would have added the default administrator account, which wasn't there before, it was just local admin. But I've added administrator. 
And later on, we'll see all the SharePoint accounts get created. And I can see it's just kicking off and it's starting to do various things. I can see it's still going through the various installs. I think SQL is done now. I think it's moving on to SharePoint. I can always check if the SQL is healthy. If it just runs SQL command dash E. Yep. Okay. So I'm now got SQL installed on this box. I could quickly check the version. Good. So I know that worked. So now, yep, it's just going through the SharePoint. So I know it's going through those conflicts. If I look at my AD now, I should see all the SharePoint accounts were created. So that's just carrying on. So again, just showing all automated. I'm logged on just to show you, but completely unattended install of all of this stuff. So as I look inside my VM, it looks like it's calmed down. I see the SharePoint timer service. So I could try this local host. I've been trying it a couple of times. It hasn't worked. Let's try it again. Now generally, the first time you access, it's very slow. It has to go through, compile the pages just in time. And this should be just up. Oh, there we go. So there's the general SharePoint page. And I should be able to access externally via that public IP as well. So if I come out of the, actually where I ran the PowerShell from, and change this bit of code. Run. This just starts a process with a file path, which is a URL, which will basically just mean it would open this web page. Now you notice it has finished, but my PowerShell was still running, so I have a 40 minute wait in there. Uh, the 40 minutes is kind of that worst case scenario. So it's pointing me for credential, so I could use that local admin. And I'm in. So that kind of completes the demonstration. Hopefully it's useful. Um, again, remember in this example, I have RDP just out to the internet, which is a very bad thing. It's not secure, especially with these simple passwords I have. So I would strongly encourage you to have strong passwords. Don't open RDP up to the internet. Ideally, you're going to connect this to an on-premises network via site, site VPN, via express route, maybe even point to site. Um, but always be very cognizant of exposing things out to the internet, especially RDP. And if I was finished with this, if I wanted to just now tear this down, I can literally just run this piece of code, which removes the resource group with a false, which will delete all the resources in the resource group, which is my NIC, it's my virtual network, it's my storage account, and it's the VM itself. So thank you very much.